ka -chow. What's poppin' YouTube? It's your boy, Jimmy, back again. Sorry, imagine if I talk like that. I was talking with my friend and friend of the channel, Joe, uh, the other week about reenactment, because we're, we're both reenactors. We've both been in the hobby for years and years and years, and we've both done various periods. I started doing the English Civil War, so the 1640s, and he started with Viking Age and his wife uh, was in English Civil War reenactment for a long time and she's now been taken over to the dark side of Viking Age reenactment. And we were talking about people's kit standards and how the standard of kit has really improved over the last uh, 15 years that we've both been doing reenactment. As a hobby, historical reenactment has its roots in, in, well, it has its roots in the Roman Empire, but as a, a modern hobby, it has its roots in the Victorian period, and it really comes into its own in the 1970s and onwards, with groups like the Sealed Knot and the SCA becoming really big, and a lot of the reasons for people joining these societies when they first started was so that they could go away for the weekend with their friends and get drunk in a field. Nowadays, a lot of people join reenactment societies so that they can get drunk with their friends and spend the weekend in a field. So progress has been huge in the hobby, and one of the places where you see a lot of progress, especially over the last 10, 15, 20 years, is people's attitudes towards their clothing, where 20 or 30 years ago, a lot of people were wearing the same kit year in, year out. It would get thrown in a box in October, it would get taken out of the box in April, and they would then wear it at weekends, and then they wouldn't look at it over the winter time. And it's why you see a lot of pictures of reenactors wearing tatty clothes, ragged clothes, really rusty male shirts, armour with bits missing and cracked leather and that kind of thing. And it's a lot more difficult now to actually see people wearing truly egregious kit at most events. There are some places where you're kind of guaranteed to see people wearing bad kit, like York Viking Festival or Volin or the, the big SCA events. You will see people who are just there for the beer and pretzels, do not care what they look like, do not care about the condition of their clothing. But one of the things that Joe was talking about was the excuse that somebody had for this at a 17th century event. So this guy was dressed in his 1640s clothes, he was wearing his breeches, his stockings, his hose, he was wearing his, his doublet, his or his soldier's coat probably, and he had a felt hat on, and his soldier's coat was ragged, it was... It was shot to pieces. It looked like it had been eaten by moths and also a saber-toothed tiger, and then he put it on. And Joe said to the guy, whoa, your sleeve's looking a bit ragged there. And he went, oh yeah, well, it's period. And Joe didn't really compute this, and he asked him what he meant by it being period. And the guy said, well, at the time when they were on campaign, they wouldn't have had the time or the skills to repair their clothing. And at that point, Joe took the sensible option and walked away, because <clears throat> that is energy that people who don't do YouTube videos just don't have. It takes a lot of energy to actually engage somebody like that in conversation and say, okay, I see what you're saying, but what you're saying is crap. And that is, that is the, the bread and butter of the average YouTuber, because we have lots of people doing stuff like that in the comment section, and people come up to you in the street every now and then and will say, hey, I think you're wrong about this thing, uh, and emails will be sent to you at your business email account that you say is specifically for business, telling you stuff like that, for a number of reasons. So this video we're going to look at whether people in the past actually did take care of their clothing, and if so, how. The answer will not surprise you. So I think the main first thing that we have to talk about here is when we talk about reenactment, a lot of the time we talk about military reenactment. And in most militaries, most modern armies uh, in the 21st century have something in them that has been around for centuries. This is a specific kind of creature. It's an animal, if you like. And this animal is called the sergeant. And the sergeant is a creature that has evolved specifically to spot holes in uniforms from a distance of up to 350 yards. Uh, it can spot shoes and boots that haven't been polished from half a mile away, and it can spot missing buttons from the other side of a planet. So, the idea, <laughs> the idea that a soldier in a professional army doesn't repair his kit, or their kit, is nonsense for the last few centuries. So, 
people will always try and counter this with, yeah, but what about if they're on campaign? What about if they're if they're fighting men and they're on the front line? Well, here is a picture of some French soldiers, one of whom is sewing on the Western Front. Mm -hmm. uh, here is a picture of two Canadian artillerymen in 1944. One of them is sewing. Uh -huh. uh, and here is a photograph of some men from the American Civil War, and they're reading, writing letters home, doing their laundry, and sewing their uniforms up. So soldiers were sewing their clothes up whilst on campaign, because the basic mistake here, I think, is the idea that you wouldn't have time on campaign because you're moving. And yes, you are moving, but your average army doesn't move that fast and doesn't really move that far before the invention of the train. In fact, a lot of the time you will be spending sitting around, waiting for the baggage train to arrive, waiting for something else, waiting for them to rebuild that bridge over the river that the enemy army has just destroyed. You'll be eating, you'll be taking breaks whilst the generals figure out which direction you're supposed to be marching in because they seem to be going the wrong way, and generals are good at that. And you do have time. There is downtime. If you ask any veteran soldier, any real veteran soldier will tell you that even in times of war, a lot of the time is spent doing nothing, waiting for short periods of intense, unpleasant, stressful activity. So there's a lot of time to sew up that hole in your doublet if you need to, especially in the 17th century, where we're not necessarily talking about professional armies. So in pre-modern and early modern armies, there's this interesting phenomenon of the camp follower. And the camp follower isn't somebody wearing a flamboyant shirt following you around singing show tunes. The camp follower is somebody who follows the army, and it's very often the wives and other family members of soldiers who are out on campaign. We've got plenty of examples of camp followers. One camp follower from medieval London actually then opened a pub in Westminster after serving in France with various armies, and she worked as a laundress and as a seamstress, uh, and she then went back to London and opened this tavern in Westminster. I can't remember her name. Editing Jimmy will put it there. But camp followers served a very, very important function, which was that they provided laundry services. Laundry is a specialist task in well, right up to the modern age, if you put the wrong thing on the wrong setting in your washing machine, you will F that up. Like, I have already, I've shrunk a pair of wool socks once this year already, and that's irritating because I felt I should know better than to put woolen socks into a washing machine. But if you put your average squaddy in charge of cleaning and laundering his own clothing, something is going to go wrong somewhere. So, a lot of camp followers were in charge of repairing and laundering clothing, whilst a soldier would be expected still to be able to do the basics himself, like cleaning his boots, his weapons and equipment, and sewing a button back onto his coat if he needed it doing. So, you have the camp follower who provides these services, but still, that shoots that excuse down. If you are a member of this army and you're marching across during the English Civil War, there will be somebody near you in a camp who will either say, Oi, get that jacket sewn up, or will say, Oi, give me that jacket, you're not going on parade like that, I'll sew it up for you, come back for it in an hour, go and get me a pail of water from the stream. It, 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 nobody wants you to look ragged, and nobody wants to look ragged in historical terms. Looking ragged means that you are destitute, that you are poor, and that is, in many time periods and in many places, considered a shameful thing. It's considered to be a shame on you if you're too poor to, for example, sew a button back on your coat so you look slovenly. And it doesn't make it look like you're a rough, tough soldier on campaign. It makes you look like a slovenly soldier. So there's this idea that you don't have time, you don't have the skills, is the other one. The idea that you don't have the skill. They wouldn't have had the skill to sew up their own clothing. And to combat that idea, I present to you the housewife. The housewife, or the husif, is the soldier's sewing kit. And soldier's sewing kits have been uh, issued for a very long time. Here's an example from the American Civil War, belonged to a soldier of the 16th Maine Regiment, and here's one from the First World War, from a British soldier's kit. They're still issued in the army, in the British army, in the American army, they're still issued. You are still expected to have... Actually, I don't know if they are in the US army. I know that up until 2015, though, the Quartermastery School of the US Army taught soldiers sewing skills. So they had a room full of sewing machines, and you would be taught by a senior quartermaster 
how to sew. So far from not having the skills, soldiers were issued, at least for the last 175, 200 years, with a sewing kit. And this replaces, as the name suggests, the camp follower, the housewife. This replaces the women who are following you on campaign, who might be able to do some of that sewing for you. So, these men in the First World War, these men in the Second World War, modern soldiers, have sewing kits with them. Because you are expected to maintain your kit to a standard, so that the great predatory sergeant doesn't spot you from across the Great Plain, sniff you, and then come bearing down on you with his sharpened teeth. You maintain your kit, because if you're wearing ragged clothing, there's something wrong with you. If there's something wrong with you, then you get taken out of your unit to find out what the hell is wrong with you. Like, why is your clothing ragged? Why do you look like a beggar? What's going on here? Like, are you incapable of sewing your clothing? Right, why are you incapable of sewing your clothing? We need to get you on a course that will teach you to sew your clothing up, because this is ridiculous. Did nobody else, did none of your messmates tell you how to sew a button back on? D d does none of them know how to put a patch onto a jacket? Seriously, nobody, nobody in this regiment could teach you how to sew your trousers shut so I don't have to look at your bum on parade. Really? That seems unlikely. You're lying, you're going to be flogged. Welcome to the 17th century, it's a brutal place. But, there's this non-military idea as well in reenactment that people weren't looking after their kit, that if you were a medieval peasant, uh, you would have tatty, ragged clothes as standard. And that is just not true. We have, off the top of my head, I can think of three or four examples of clothing that was repaired in the Viking Age. Um, the Hedeby hose, the hose from Haithabu, from, from Hedeby, have patches on the bottoms of them. Uh, the, the other set of hose, without the feet, have been extended and repaired. They've got a repair seam at the top. Uh, the Coppergate sock, the famous Norbind sock from York, has stitching on the underside where a patch had been applied. There was an applied patch to this Norbind sock. Uh, the Bernuthsfeld tunic, obviously the Bernuths Bernuthsfeld tunic has, I think, 45 different patches of cloth on it. Like, 20 different types of cloth, making this tunic wearable again. There's, there's later stuff, there's 16th century, 17th century even clothes like the Gunnister Man's outfit, the Gunnister Man, whose clothes I think are now in the National Museum of Scotland, was found, he's a late 17th century man, with uh, a coat, an inner coat, pair of breeches uh, and some stockings. Uh, I don't think he's wearing breeches, is he? Or is he just wearing... No, he's wearing trues. He's wearing trues. And all of it's patched. It's it's all patched. He's wearing loads of patched stuff. His knitted... Little knitted gloves have been repaired as well. He's got patch repairs on his gloves. Uh, the Quintfall Hill Man from some estate in Scotland. Editing Jimmy will put it up on the screen. Another late 17th century Scot wearing breeches that were described as as excessively patched, excessively patched breeches. The thing about poor people in history is, if your clothes start to wear out, you don't go to Primark and buy a new one for two pounds that's been made in a sweatshop. What you do is you find any scrap of cloth, any piece of fabric you can, and you repair that garment so it will last you that little bit longer, because you don't have the money to spend on clothes. You don't have that but you need your clothes to work. I remember my grandma, when I was little, on her proper foot treadle powered sewing machine, repairing clothes, making clothes, making curtains, putting patches in things, darning things with a darning mushroom. It's a skill that so many people in reenactment forget was universal at one point, until very recently. Universally, if you are a medieval peasant, you come in from the fields and you have got a hole in your tunic, somebody in your household or extended family group will say, get that off, we're darning that, and we're fixing it, because you're not going out wearing that. That's You're not doing that. You'll rip it further, you'll damage it, you'll get it even worse, and then you'll come back tomorrow and you'll be shirtless because your tunic will be in bits in a, in a field. And we've got amazing ones. There's a fantastic tunic from... It's in the museum in Manchester, I forget which one, but it's a, it's an, a 9th or 10th century wool tunic from Egypt. So this tunic, this amazing blue tunic, it's a beautiful tunic and it's got an applied decoration on the shoulders and around the neck. So it's got this lovely red and gold brocade decoration applied to the top of it there. So this little boy's tunic, it's only a child's tunic, would have looked so gorgeous when it was new. It would have been 
beautiful. This would have been his lovely, lovely best tunic. And at some point, it's either been thrown away to somebody else, it's been given to a servant or to somebody else, or it's been handed down to the family. And it has been darned, and it has been darned, and it has been darned. And it's more darn than fabric at this point. It's absolutely fantastic. It's covered in these patches of darning, and some of them are blue to try and match the tunic, some of them are brown and done in a pattern, so they're pattern darned. And it just is, it's an amazing piece of work. But this is two, three, four maybe generations of children wearing this tunic. Like this is, this is older brother wearing this tunic, giving it to younger brother, who then gives it to older brother's first child, who then wears it for a little bit, and then it gets given to younger brother's first child, or to baby brother once baby brother is old enough to wear it. This is really hard-worn clothing. And it's beautiful, because somebody really cared about this tunic. Somebody put so much effort into repairing it. And I love that. It's absolutely fantastic. And that's similar to... <clears throat> um, some of the other tunics that we have, like the Bednathsfeld tunic, obviously that's excessive, that's 45 patches. Somebody needed a tunic and thought, I've got 45 scraps of wool, I'm just going to make a tunic out of it. Like, it is motley at its most motley, and we don't know if this is through excessive repair, if this is for a beggar to wear, and it's just been thrown together by somebody and said, hey, you need a tunic, here you go, wear that, it's better than, it's better than nudity, isn't it? in the cold, like, no, we don't know if that's what's happened here, but we do know that things like the Coppergate sock, this is just a sock, like, to us this is an amazing artefact, uh, it's, it's a really valuable thousand-year-old piece of clothing, a rare survivor, but a thousand years ago, this is a sock, mate, like, it's, it's a sock, it's like those, those socks that you just buy at the airport because you need an extra pair because they've lost your bag, like, it's nothing special, right? So, somebody has still gone to the effort Emergency services. A sip of tea. Some nice Darjeeling tea today. But this is a sock that somebody's cared for. This is a sock that somebody has taken the time to repair. Because it matters. It's important. I saw a stat the other day that said that we now have enough clothing on the planet to clothe six generations of people. And I've decided I'm not going to buy a, a new garment of clothing this year. I'm not going to buy a new piece of clothing this year. I don't want one. If, if people want to knit me a pair of socks, UK size 10, in pure wool, then fine. That's lovely. If if I buy an antique piece of clothing to replace one that's worn out, that's, that's okay. But I'm not buying new clothes anymore. I don't need to. And people in the past didn't need to very often because you made your clothes last. I Again, I remember my grandma wearing, uh, in the 90s, wearing a dress from the 1960s because she kept it good, and it looked fantastic. She was so elegant and well-dressed, but it was cared for. And there's really no excuse anymore. People say, reenactors saying, oh, they wouldn't have repaired them in the past. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. You wear your clothes properly, and you care for them properly, and they will last. If you don't do stuff like this, where your trouser leg is just dragging on the floor, what? why do you do this? Viking reenactors do this all the time. Why do you do this, guys? Why do you wear your pants on the floor? They'll be shredded in minutes, hours. Pin the hem up and sew your pants properly. Like, it's not hard. It's not difficult to do. It's really not. And if you don't know how to do it, find a nearby friend who does, or go on the website that you're watching this video on. You know how many sewing tutorials there are on YouTube? Do you know how much time and effort people like Bernadette put into teaching people good basic sewing skills that will make your clothes last? I mean, oh, it's it's under the tea. It's under the tea. If you've like, if you've got a shilling to spare, go and buy Bernadette's book. Go and buy it. Just go and buy the book. It's great. It's brilliant. It will teach you stuff. It will teach you things. If you don't know the basics of sewing, buy this book. It's really cool, and it has really cool people in it as well. Just go and get it. it you, you, will t be, you will be taught how to wash your clothes by this book. She's not sponsoring the video, she's just written a really good book. Go and buy it. Learn how to care for your kit, guys. For goodness sake. I have an under tunic made of linen that is covered in patches. Why? Because I left it to dry once at an event and some sparks from a campfire blew onto it. Oh no, it's got some sparks on it. Do I throw it away and buy another one? And do I wear it covering holes? No. 
I darn it and patch it so that it works properly. Goodness sake! I'm sorry, but it's a real... It's a bugbear. I really hate watching reenactors who clearly don't care about their clothing the way that people in the past would. You want to be more authentic in your reenactment? Care about your clothes. Clean your chainmail. I don't want to see you look like a hedgehog. You're just brown with rust with your crappy chainmail that you throw into a box in a damp garage in October and don't look at it until April time. You look awful. You look dreadful. It's not like I can bear so much. I can bear pop rivets and black leather and beard rings if you just look after your kit. If I see you wearing a really shonky looking cotton tunic but you've darned and patched it, you've gone up in my estimation by a factor of 20 because you care about your clothes and that's what we lose in reenactment a lot of the time. People forget that. Like imagine that guy with his coat ragged with the lining visible all down the sleeve. Imagine going up to your grandmother or your great-grandmother and saying, oh, well, people wouldn't have had time. She would give you a slap around the head and you would deserve it because people absolutely had the time and the skill and they cared enough to keep their clothing wearable. That's such a disgusting attitude to have. Ugh, Javi. I don't know. I need another sip of tea to calm myself down. So we've got all these examples of, of clothing. Let's have a look at a couple more of them in detail. So the Lendbrain tunic. You might know about the Lendbrain Pass. It's, it's, it's scary, but it's where we're finding an awful lot of really cool Viking Age and later antique items. And the, uh, the Lendbrain tunic is a, a woolen tunic from the 3rd century. And it's got patches on it. These patches are just pieces of cloth that have been sewn on fairly roughly a lot of the time. And it's been lost at some point. We're not sure how it's been lost. But the, the tunic itself is really simple. It's, it's just a geometrically square cut tunic. So it's very simply made, pretty simply sewn. But somebody's obviously cared about it enough to put patches into it to extend the life of the garment. That's what repair is all about. It's about extending the life of your clothes. And that's very much what we see in things like the Haithabu hose, the Hedabu hose. <clears throat> They're covered in seams, and you get reenactors sometimes who see lots of seams and think, oh, hmm, oh, interesting, why are these seams here? They serve no apparent purpose. Probably just replaced the bit at the top that ripped off. Bit of, bit of the top of the hose came off, snip it, reattach it. Oh, my, my, my hose of, of torn, well, what do I do? Well, if I chop that bit, and I chop that bit, and then I shunt them together, I'll have a slightly shorter but still working pair of hose. Yeah, that'll do. Go for it. Pfft. Sew it up and wear it again. There's also a replacement foot sole on one of the Hedeby hose. I'm not sure which pair though, and I don't want to put a picture up in case I put the wrong picture up, but there's one of the hose has the sole of the foot has been replaced, which is really cool because you see that in shoes as well. A lot of the shoes from York, the Viking Age shoes, have clump repairs on the sole, uh, and some of them are really roughly just whipped to the sole. Some of them have a, a beautiful tunnel stitch. It's clearly been done by a proper shoemaker or a cobbler, uh, and I'm going to do a, a video on shoemaking soon, which will be really cool. And it's really fun to see all of these different repairs, like people using their clothes, it's great. This cardigan, I'm wearing my second cardigan right now because my first jumper and first shirt are both in the wash because I look after my clothes. Um, this has got a couple of darns in it here and there. I've got a jumper actually at home, I'll see if I can get a picture of it, um, that is more darn than fabric. It's a knitted, grey knitted jumper, it's just a jumper from a shop, like it wasn't made for me by a friend or anything, but I patched it and patched it and darned it and darned it and darned it and my mam darned it and it's just got these incredible darns all the way down both sleeves. It's absolutely fantastic. I was banned from wearing it a few years ago, which I think is a great shame. It was part of my uniform. But there we go. People have looked after their clothes. Like even Gunnister Mann was, was repairing his gloves. He was looking after his gloves. Even uh, men in the trenches in the First World War were sewing their clothing up in lulls in the fighting, because there are lulls in fighting, amazingly, uh, in the First World War. They aren't constantly being gassed and shelled. And if you really want to improve your reenactment, improve your attitude to your clothes. Don't just see it as an excuse to buy a new pair of shoes or a new tunic every time you go to an event. Use it as an excuse to buy some leather and learn basic leatherworking skills so that you can put a clump sole repair on your shoes. Use it as an excuse to buy some lovely endangered or ancient breed wool, some yarn, so that you can darn your tunics or patch your tunics. And hopefully this video will have helped you 
a little bit to see that people were doing all of this in the past and you can do it too and it's really easy to do. If I can do it, if I can learn how to do it, you can. I've got half a functioning human brain. Uh, the rest is just jelly. So if, if you can, if I can do it, you can do it. And take inspiration from the little boy's tunic in Manchester, that amazing tunic from the 9th century, which is the Viking Age, and people were darning it and repairing it and passing it on. I want to see more kids in reenactment wearing their parents' old tunics. I want to see more people passing on their kit. For the first three years in reenactment, I didn't have a new piece of kit on me. It was all hand-me-downs, and it was fantastic. So keep your kit in good repair. Go buy Bernadette's book, learn how to darn, learn how to patch, and go to the Patreon if you want to support the channel financially. People have been asking about a bookshelf tour, and I've just filmed that for the Patreon, so if you're interested in that and you want to help support the channel, pop over to the Patreon. Thank you to all of my patrons, thank you to everybody who sent me some wonderful new mail to my new P.O. box. You're all fantastic. Uh, I really, really appreciate you watching my videos. You're, you're keeping a roof over my head. And I've got some really exciting news coming up that hopefully I'll be able to share with you all soon. So, Dielchen Vaudian, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed. And until the next time, Tanatronissa, Will Daur, bye bye. Oh, thank you to everyone asking how my leg is doing. I have a, a, a bit of a condition in my knee, so I've been on lots of codeine for the last week or so. It's getting there, it's getting a little bit better every now and then, but, you know, soft tissue injuries take ages to heal. This ain't my first rodeo. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine.